So welcome to lecture number two, and we're looking at pop art and minimalism. So this is kind of like a pre-contemporary type of art movement, but it's a pretty good place to start after the introduction that we had, because it's a good transition from the modernist style that I was talking about in the early 20th century to the um, postmodern style that we're going to look at um, in this class. Although... Again, as I mentioned in the first lecture, uh, we might be in post-postmodernism, so we're not sure exactly. Uh, so the first piece we're looking at is um, a pop art style from Roy Lichtenstein. It's called Wham! And um, this style was called the New American Realism. Uh, the pop artists felt that comic books, soup cans, and other mass-produced items were more indicative of our lives than any other subject. Um, they thought about... In this case, specifically, Lichtenstein wanted to take the everyday and make it into the monumental. So kids would read comic books um, every day at the time this was made in the 1960s, uh, and still do today sometimes, and imagine that they are the heroes. So Lichtenstein wanted to take this idea and just blow it up like it does in a child's head. Uh, so kind of creating a realist art, as in it's something that represents real life, but it's also the real life fantasy life of a child. Uh, so not about real things per se, uh, but about real experiences that people have. Um, so in some ways, uh, the artists were responding to the art style that was popular in the United States previous to this, which was known as um, abstract expressionism. And Jackson Pollock is kind of the uh, prototypical abstract expressionist. And as you can see, uh, he was known for putting his giant canvases on the floor and doing almost this dance with the paint. And he would end up with this very, very abstract paint. And he would always name the painting something, like this one's called Convergence, that would represent whatever feeling he was having. And this style was also known as being kind of a performance style in some ways. Uh, he called his style action painting, um, and he actually got famous when his art dealer made a movie of him uh, performing, as in painting one of his paintings. But the pop artist felt that this sort of style was really, um, was really far away from most people's experience. Uh, and they wanted to get back to the types of experiences that people were having and have art reflect those experiences. So some of the things that had changed uh, is what you consider to be natural reality. Uh, so think about if you're going for a walk in the park or something like that. Um, but also if you think about that people before the 20th century and for a lot of people in the world, um, before this time, the piece that was made, um, they would live a life where they would have a lot of connection with the types of products they would buy, but especially the food. Uh, so, you know, people would know people who are farmers, they would know people that raised animals and slaughtered them. Um, so instead, uh, what we see um, at the time that this was made in 1968, and also continuing to uh, now is that um, natural reality had been replaced by commoditization. So when you think of the Campbell's chicken noodle that Andy Warhol is doing here, which he tried to create exactly as it is on the can, um, he started out as an advertising painter, so he was able to paint very precisely. Um, and his idea was, and this is a print though, so he would do it by hand and then make prints of it. Um, so his idea with this is that when you get a chicken noodle soup, it's not like the experience that people would have before. Like if you get a Campbell's chicken noodle soup, you get it here, you get it in California, uh, you buy it at any store and it's the exact same. Uh, and I can tell you that if you bought soup 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it would be the same as it is today. Um, so this natural reality, which could often... Um, lead to things being different from day to day is replaced with a commoditization that makes things uh, very similar every day. <clears throat> so early humans uh, hunted and gathered, uh, and in some ways that's more similar to the way that 
uh, modern humans get their food. Uh, nowadays, we graze in the supermarkets. Um, although recently, grazing in the supermarkets has been in trouble because of high inflation. Um, so one of the ideas that Andy Warhol is going for is that these types of products that are mass produced and are the same are kind of democratizing in a way. So he says, you can be watching TV and see Coca-Cola. Uh, and you know that the president drinks Coke. Liz Taylor drinks Coke. And then you think you can drink Coke too. A Coke is a Coke and no amount of money can get you a better Coke than the one that the bum on the corner is drinking. Um, so Warhol's signature image is the Campbell soup can, a product he said he ate for lunch every day for 20 years over and over again. Uh, so I guess you could kind of say that he was living his art uh, in a way. So sometimes people see this art and you're like, why is he doing things and trying to make them look exactly like these mass produced products? Uh, and the idea with this is that, again, he wants to show what people's lives are like nowadays and really how they changed, how they're truly different than they had been in the past. So sometimes, like a lot of artists will look at, he comments on earlier art. And he calls this one, which is a screen print over and over again, of a print itself, of uh, the world's most famous painting at this time and probably still today, the Mona Lisa. And he called it 30 are better than one. So this is something you can kind of think about. What is the content? In other words, what is the meaning of this particular print? And that's something, if you're looking for something to put on the extra credit board, you can address yourself uh, because the meaning isn't something that I can tell you. Uh, it's something that you can kind of think about. Um, with Andy Warhol, he always wants the viewers to participate in the art. So this is Klaus Oldenburg. Uh, and he did a lot of art that was um, a different type of pop art style where more like what Lichtenstein was doing, where he's trying to make things as large as possible. Um, so with this one, he uses an exaggerated scale of a thing that anybody would use, like if they're a gardener, um, and that they would buy at a regular store. So it's nothing special, uh, but he wanted to make it special, kind of like Lichtenstein uh, with the types of with the types of prints that he was doing based on comic books. So Oldenburg said, art should, should be literally made of the ordinary world. Its space should be our space. Its time, our time. Its objects are ordinary objects. The reality of art will replace reality. So again, he's talking about reacting in some ways to abstract expressionism, which seemed to be really far away from reality. But at the same time, like Andy Warhol, he's talking about the commodification of reality. Uh, the way that we see reality through mass media uh, or the fact that we never know who makes the stuff that that we buy, um, that that kind of separates us from things so that some, seeing something in the media can be as real as seeing something in real life. Uh, so this trowel, which is huge, and you can see the scale from the person walking next to it, uh, can be just the art of real life. Um, and in some ways, the same thing. So I like this one a lot, Spoonbridge and Cherry. Uh, but I always wonder, where is the rest of the milkshake? I really want to have some of that milkshake. So this is Frank Stella, and he's doing a style that became very popular uh, and is still popular today in some ways because um, this particular style... Um, kind of became a decorating style. Uh, and if you go to any Ikea right now, you'll find these sorts of things. Um, this one's called Empress of India 2. And despite the names that are kind of suggestive, uh, Stella's idea with these pieces is that they didn't have any meaning. Um, so minimalism, like we see with pop art, was a reaction to action painting. But it's not necessarily trying to show anything in the real life or even make a comment at all. So for instance, um, Stella said, I was getting into arguments with people who want to retain the old values in painting, the humanistic values that they find on the canvas. If you pin them down, they always end up asserting that there is something there besides the paint on the canvas. 
my painting is based on the fact that only what can be seen is there. What you see is what you get. So you could argue with Stella whether or not um, that in itself, his statement is actually the meaning of the painting. But I think you get what he was trying to say. So postmodern directions, and this is really just an introduction to the rest of the art that we're going to look at in the class. Uh, this is the architect I am Pei. This is the Grand Louvre Pyramid. Um, so this is kind of interesting. Uh, the Louvre is a very old building, but it had been built up over many, many years in many different styles. So there's stuff in here that you can find that's kind of a Renaissance style. So a style that was popular in the 1500s. Architecture that's kind of a Baroque style, so popular in the 1600s, and then even some neoclassic type of stuff. So it was already pretty eclectic. Uh, but when this was built, and the idea with building this, by the way, was the Louvre at this time was the most famous museum in the world, but it didn't really have security like a lot of modern museums had. So you could go in and out any of the entrances that you can see uh, throughout the picture here. And that was a problem. Uh, every once in a while, they would have uh, people who would try to rob paintings and literally just grab the painting and run out the door. So nothing fancy like like a Hollywood movie or anything. So they wanted to get better security. So they made it so that um, everyone had to go through an underground entrance. But it's a Louvre, so they didn't want to make a boring entrance. So they hired I.M. Pei, who was one of the most famous architects at this time, uh, to make something that represents kind of the spirit of the Louvre. So ironically, when this was first built, many thought it was ugly. Um, and what is interesting about that is some of the people said it was ugly because the style, uh, which was very modern, um, very contemporary, didn't match uh, the style of the Louvre itself, uh, which again is kind of an irony because the style of the Louvre is many different styles over hundreds of years. Uh, but people had seen it for so long, they didn't kind of understand the history of it. Uh, so eventually people came to embrace it. It's a pretty cool experience just going inside the pyramid and seeing how the glass changes the light coming in. Um, so the idea with that um, I.M. Pei was doing is he used modern materials to create an ancient shape. So in some ways, this kind of reflects what the museum is doing. They have pieces from all the way into ancient times, including ancient Egypt, most of which are stolen, side note, um, and then all the way to today. Uh, so by using this ancient shape and creating modern materials, he's kind of creating that span. So postmodernism, I kind of defined it before, uh, but sometimes one another way to define it is a term used to describe the willfully plural and eclectic art forms of contemporary art. Um, so we'll kind of get in more into those themes. That's just one way of thinking of postmodernism, not necessarily the only way. So we're going to see a lot of reactions in the, in this kind of introduction, and then we'll get more into art that uh, is less a reaction to other art styles and more a reaction to the world. Um, so this is Judy Chicago, uh, and this is her dinner party from 1979. So we're going to see in this class that there's a lot more feminine artists than would have been able to make art and make a living from art in previous uh, generations. And part of the reason why is because um, in the Western world, but also in other parts of the world sometimes as well, uh, we live in a patriarchal society. Um, and that basically means that a society that is is controlled mostly by elites, uh, and these elites are usually men, uh, and they try to take this kind of ideology that men should run things and put it down into the rest of society. But it's important to remember that patriarchy isn't actually run by men in general, but by elite men. Um, so in some ways, artists like Judy Chicago, uh, they saw some of the arts that were being made, especially looking at minimalism, which many feminine artists did, uh, but they saw it as having no meaning. Frank Stella intentionally was making it with no meaning. And they felt that was something missing. The other thing that feminist artists and uh, feminist scholars at this time tried to do is show that the art history as we had learned it, and history in general, uh, was very patriarchal. In other words, it was centered around elite men and the types of things that they would do. So what Judy Chicago wanted to do with the dinner party is make a place setting 
for women that had been undervalued in history. Uh, and Frida Kahlo is kind of included on here. You can see there. Uh, and she made each of the place setting um, kind of in the shape of a vulva, uh, which was popular um, at that time to represent women's rights. Um, so she's very explicitly anti-formalist, meaning Frank Stilla, Stella is formalist because he just says that there's just lines and colors. Um, she wanted to have art with meaning. So not just lines and colors, but also a meaning to it. She also thought of one of the ways that um, patriarchy does things is that it tends to be authoritarian. And you tend to think of things as being done by one great person, one great man. Um, so she wanted to go the other way and think about, well, what would a culture without patriarchy look like? Uh, and to her, it would be more collaborative and collective. So this project itself was a collaborative project with many of the women that built it and with scholars and historians. So other feminist artists also tried to kind of bring back meaning, uh, but not always in an obvious way where it's easy to see what the meaning is. Um, a lot of times you can see as many meanings as you want. So this is Cindy Sherman, and the type of art that she did is she basically became a chameleon, and she would do you photographs, um, and the photographs would all be of her, but she would kind of play these parts. Her earliest ones, which were in black and white in the 1970s, uh, were pictures where she tried to look like she was from, uh, it was a photo still from a film noir movie, which is a type of movie that was popular in the 40s and 50s but occasionally would come back, uh, including at the time that this was made. And she thought those movies were interesting because they played out certain feminine roles uh, where they were kind of judging women in the way they would act. So they would have, for instance, in one of these films, they would have the femme fatale, uh, a woman who was independent from men in her life and would often be pretty expressly sexual, but also manipulative. So these film noir movies, in a way, were kind of like judging women and telling them how they should be and how they shouldn't be. Um, so she wanted to kind of look at these and portray these people uh, and, you know, not necessarily like show them as more human, but kind of just um, retake it um, back from the judgmental place that it lived in before. Um, so... Like other feminist artists, they, she wanted to critique traditional ways of seeing. They had felt that the male gaze had dominated depictions of women in art. They wanted to take back the images of women from themselves. Sherman played with the concept of identity by transforming into different women for her photographs. So the male gaze can mean many things. It can mean that when you see movies, when you see photographs, when you see art, you're always seeing feminine figures through men's eyes and through the role that the patriarchy uh, kind of demands of women. So often it will demand women to be looked at uh, and not to be active. Uh, and then will show men as active or looking at women. So the male gaze can also relate to movies, for instance. If you think of horror movies where often um, the killer in the movies are stalking and attacking women and there's this this trope of the last girl uh, who will survive and oftentimes the women who are more sexual or independent will be killed first and the final girl the last woman will be the kind of like so-called innocent um, so she takes some of these images and she kind of challenges the viewer to put themselves in the place of the killer in a way um, so a lot of times when I show this to students in class, they imagine that she was a girl and it's a young girl because she's wearing like a school uniform, had run somewhere away from this killer uh, into a house in the woods or something like that uh, and had been knocked over and now is scared and afraid the killer is going to come and get her. So Sherman is kind of making a comment that when these movies are made and when they're through the male gaze and there's violence against women, that in some ways you're encouraged to take that view on uh, and take the view of the violent man who's uh, attacking these women. 
So she did a lot of pieces where they kind of recall certain movies. Um, there was a movie called The Badlands with Sissy Spacek and Martin Sheen. Um, and you can look it up if you want on Wikipedia or something like that. And that particular film had Sissy Spacek uh, playing a kind of like simple woman um, who lived in the country and she wore a dress like this and part of it. Uh, and uh, she was taken in by the kind of cool guy with the white t-shirt and jeans uh, and cool car played by Martin Sheen. And they ended up traveling around the country committing crimes. And we definitely see Sissy Spacek's character as being a kind of helpless victim in a way. Um, so again, Cindy Sherman is like basically recalling this. So all of our photographs until about the year 2000 were self-portraits, which is amazing to think about when you see them because uh, it's hard to believe that they're all the same person. Uh, but she's really good at, at, at kind of doing costumes. Um, so that's Cindy Sherman on the top left as herself, <laughs> the way she looked when this um, when this was made in about 2000. Um, and uh, on the picture on the right, um, she talks about this in the video. Uh, so if you look up Art 21 and Cindy Sherman, you'll be able to find some videos uh, from PBS where she talks about her work. So you're not required to do it, but if you feel like it, I'll put a link in the description to this video. And she liked to think about, um, she was living in New York at this time. It's a good place for art. Uh, and she liked to do these images of so-called society women. So if you ever go to New York City and you're in Manhattan um, and you go to Central Park, there's a lot of neighborhoods around Central Park and they're all very, very wealthy. And if you walk down there, you'll often find older women um, and these older women may might have been born rich, they might be aristocrats, or they might have married a rich man. Um, and even though um, they're older and a lot of like, and this is kind of one of the expectations of women, is that when they get older, they're supposed to be not to dress up as much or wear so much makeup or do their hair every day. But when you see these women in New York, um, you see that they are dressing up all the time. They're wearing fashionable clothes but usually fashionable clothes from a different time. Uh, so Cindy Sherman did a whole series with these women where she kind of tried to place herself inside of these women and, you know, how they would consider themselves. So you see her with her chin up, looking down at us, uh, perhaps being a little defiant. It always reminds me of uh, Ivanka Trump, uh, Donald Trump's first wife, who uh, divorced him and got a ton of his money. Uh, so perhaps thinking about her. So this is Marina Abramovic and Ule, who was, um, I hesitate to say boyfriend because they considered their relationship to be more than just a romantic relationship. Uh, they considered themselves to be kind of like, um, like I guess but some people would say soulmates nowadays, but I don't know if that's the term they would use but very, very close people, and they did work together for a long time. This one, Imponderabilia, is an example of what you would call performance art. Um, so you can see this is at a gallery, Moderna, um, Bologna in Italy in 1977. And what Ulean and, and Abramovic did is they placed themselves at the only exit to this particular gallery, uh, and there was no hint when you entered the gallery that this is how you would have to exit it. Uh, so people would be surprised to see a couple of naked people, uh, and they are completely naked, uh, kind of like blocking the entrance and, and forcing them to go through. So they had a hidden camera set up to record uh, what people did when they went through. Um, so you can see that whenever you go through, they made it such that it was so narrow, the space, that you had to choose who you faced and who choose who you would put your back to. Uh, so as you can see, this man is choosing to put his back to Ule uh, and to face Marina Abramovic. So she does a lot of pieces like this. If you go to the Detroit Institute of Art, for instance, you can find that usually they have a video piece of hers where um, she's just trying to hold on to a big giant pot of water. 
and it's 13 minutes long and she's shaking by the end of it. Um, so a lot of times she wants to kind of explore discomfort uh, and explore how people react to women versus how they react to men. So this is Barbara Kruger, and I really should have done more with her, but I'm going to do other feminist artists later on. Uh, and she called all of her pieces untitled, and then there would be a subtitle, and she would use kind of a collage type style or an advertising type style, and that would be the subtitle. So you are a captive audience. Um, so one of the things that Kruger liked to look at was mass media and advertising and how they prescribed certain roles for women. So with this one, the captive audience, uh, she's talking about marriage. Uh, and a lot of times in some societies, and she definitely saw that American society at this time could be like this as well, even though there was this ideal of romance and you marry someone that you love. In some way, marriages were business relationships. And in some ways, a man could think of himself as buying a woman. So this is 1992. And by this time, um, there was more women in the workplace than there had been uh, during the 1950s and 60s. And I should mention, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, but the 50s and 60s were an odd time. Um, it was a time when people that were relatively well off uh, or just working people, uh, they could have, women could stay at home and um, take care of children and take care of the house. Uh, and men could often work and support an entire family with just one job. So there's some advantages to that, uh, but there's also disadvantages to that. Uh, and Kruger is kind of talking about both of them in a way. So he's talking about how... Um, the idea that the man can prove that he can provide, uh, in some ways, he's buying a woman. Uh, so many women, and it was encouraged for people to move out to the suburbs in the 50s and 60s, they became isolated, isolated from their family and from the other types of organizations, women's organizations or churches or clubs uh, that would give them kind of space away from men and also space uh, to be able to kind of make their own way uh, to have their own life. Um, but with this new idea in the 50s and 60s of being a housewife, uh, this would sometimes isolate women. So um, in 1992, by this time, people are already being forced basically to get jobs no matter what, uh, choice or not. Uh, but she's still talking about how the advertising at this time and still to this day uh, promotes this idea you give someone a very, very expensive rock and she's going to want to marry you. Um, so kind of exploring these types of ideas. So this is Yasumusa uh, Morimura and his nine faces. Uh, so I did this very carefully. So I'll kind of show you what Morimura is doing. He liked to look at Western art um, and kind of iconographic images and try to recreate them through photography. So as you can see, this is a frame color photograph, but you may not have noticed what he did, what he changed is every person in the photograph is Morimura. So this is Morimura, that's Morimura, that's Morimura. Even the corpse that's being worked on is Morimura. Um, so this kind of represents a little bit, uh, and Morimura is aware of this, the Japanese fascination with American and Western culture. And this was a kind of a big deal in the 80s, but it's still something you see today. And you see an exchange with cultures where they the kind of consumption uh, and creative use of Western culture uh, becomes something new in Japanese culture and then makes its way back West. Um, so he's kind of commenting on that kind of fascination. And you probably were, were thinking, wait, this is 1989 this is a photograph. So he didn't Photoshop this. There was no Photoshop available. He had to use old techniques. So it was pretty difficult to do. So his idea was, is that he was Andy Warhol's conceptual son. Um, his art was called appropriation art. So that mean, that term has a different meaning today. Oftentimes when people talk about appropriation, they're talking about someone who's from a traditionally um, dominant culture um, taking things and using cultural items 
from someone that's from an oppressed culture. Um, but with Mori Mora, it's more that just that his idea is that when he makes these images, he's not making any comment. He's just taking them and reflecting them back to you through his face. This is him. Um, and not making any comment. Uh, so it probably doesn't mean the same um, as appropriation does today. Uh, the, although over time, it could certainly mean that. So a good way to look at Mori Mora, and I highly suggest you do this, is look up his name and do a Google image search. And you can find all of the images that he did. And like Cindy Sherman, all of the images are him. So check it out and you can get a better deal of how Morimura's art works. So this is uh, Nam Joon Paik. Uh, he's Korean, but again, we're kind of looking at artists that became uh, famous in the New York scene. Uh, so he was part of what's called the Fluxus Group. Um, John Cage, who was American, was part of it. Yoko Ono, um, who became uh, an American, was living in New York. Uh, and... Just to give you an idea of what this is all about, the Fluxus Group, uh, their idea was to make art that um, was separated, to like commented on the separation of art and the viewer. So if you think about art, when you go to a museum, you often look at the picture, then you go to the next one, and you look at another picture. They were thinking, well, that's not very interesting. It's not... Uh, the types of things we should be doing. Instead, we should be interacting with the audience. So John Cage, for instance, was a composer, uh, and he would make songs, and I'm going to link one in the description, that were kind of trying to involve the audience. Uh, so I saw a performance, um, long after John Cage had died, but a performance of some of his music at Bowling Green State University, and it was interesting. So usually when you go to see like an orchestra or some kind of musical performance uh, that's not like a rock show or a rap show or something, um, they're going to start right on time. So you go into the auditorium, you get in there, there's a bunch of musicians tuning on stage. And then if the show is going to start at 730, uh, the conductor comes up, goes click, 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 and they start playing. Um, but when I went to this performance, when you get there, it's supposed to start at 730. And there's no musicians on the stage. There isn't even any chairs on the stage. <laughs> um, but then after a few minutes, you hear some stuff going on backstage, someone playing a horn, um, and you kind of hear it move throughout the backstage. Then you see someone walk across the stage and they're playing an instrument and, they're, and then they disappear backstage. Then without thinking about it, all of a sudden you see um, behind you there's someone playing an instrument and they came from the back door and they're walking down the aisle right through the audience. Um, so that's what John Cage wanted to do. He wanted to take art and kind of break this glass that's between the performer and the audience uh, and make the audience part of it. Um, so I'll get back to him in a moment later. And then Yoko Ono was also interested in this thing, in this kind of stuff. Um, she was... She was had a long-term relationship with uh, John Lennon from the Beatles. Uh, and um, if you're white, um, some of your grandparents might uh, think that the Yoko Ono broke up the Beatles. That's because they're racist. Um, that's not actually what happened. But Yoko Ono also tried to do musical performances where she would involve the audience um, and actually had a big influence on the type of music that people play um, in the 1990s, starting in the 1990s, but still today. So this group was inserted in things like Zen, Zen philosophy, uh, which is the name for uh, a type of philosophy that developed in China and Japan. Dada, which is an art movement from the early 20th century uh, that was interested in absurdity, and Taoism, which is the animistic religion of China. You don't have to know a whole lot of details about this kind of stuff. Um, so what Nam Jun Paik was known for was video art. And not the way you might think of video art nowadays, where it's just a strange movie, uh, but literally art with video uh, cameras, with video displays. And this kind of stuff was pretty hard to do back then. Um, he said, just as the collage replaced oil paint, the cathode ray tube will replace the canvas. Uh, so cathode ray tube 
uh, or CRT is how all TVs used to be. So if you know someone that has a very old television, you'll see these very heavy TVs. Um, and that sounds kind of silly in a way, uh, but I mean, in some ways he turned out to be right. Um, we see that a lot of art, think of video games and movies, that's the way most people experience things that are meant to be artistic, uh, or even think of like musicians that make music videos. Um, so in some ways, he was probably correct. So this one, the piece with the piano, it's kind of cool because he took a player piano and then you see it from all these angles. And he's kind of playing on the fact that a player piano goes by itself. Um, so he's putting the camera on nobody. He's putting the camera on almost the robot, more or less. He would also do performances himself uh, with a piano. And sometimes he would start playing the piano and he was a good piano player, um, good keyboard player in general. And he would stop all of a sudden and take out a sledgehammer, which he had at the ready, uh, and start destroying the piano. So you might have seen like some rock bands, like from a rock band from the 90s, Nirvana. They used to, after their shows were over, destroy all their instruments. Uh, and a rock band called The Who in the 1960s and 70s used to do the same. And um, that, you know, maybe somebody can get hurt, but... Uh, usually the only thing that gets hurt are instruments <laughs> when they do that. But a piano is different. Uh, a piano is filled with strings that are very high tension. And the high strings um, are very sharp. Uh, so basically what he was doing is he was um, doing something that was far more dangerous than what the rock musicians did. Uh, so John Cage uh, actually went to one of Nam June Paik's performances where he's doing this. And he was standing kind of like um, in a side stage. So looking at the stage from, from backstage. Um, and when he started breaking apart the piano, um, Nam June Paik, when he started breaking apart the piano, one of the high strings went flying at John Cage and cut his head pretty seriously. He was bleeding a lot. Um, and when Nam June Paik went to backstage and saw what happened, he's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Uh, but he said, no, I should have been paying attention. This is great. This is amazing. <laughs> he involved the audience. Um, so some of his pieces, he was doing things that people hadn't really done before. Nowadays, these sorts of video displays are pretty easy to do with any computer, and you just get a bunch of video displays. But at this time, there wasn't really any method that was out there to do it. He actually befriended from people, some people at the Sony company, and at this time in the 1980s, uh, and most companies don't do this anymore, uh, Sony had a division where uh, some of their engineers could just basically do what they wanted, do stuff that maybe didn't lead to a product, but was something fun. Uh, so they developed a lot of things um, at this like lab uh, that were used uh, by Nam June Paik. So the type of software that was used to control um, all of these video screens uh, was used at that time. So you can see that it's 201 television sets with four laser discs. If you're not familiar, laser discs are kind of an old version of a DVD. Um, they were about the size of a, a record, but you could put video, but you could also put digital information on it. Uh, so it basically allowed you to control how the screens were working. And he called this piece Fin de Siècle II. So a little bit of background. Um, fin de Siècle is what people in the 20th century called the end of the 19th century. Uh, and that's because they saw all of the fast changes that were happening in the 19th century, um, the worldwide spread of capitalism, uh, more and more technology, uh, faster technology, and saw things changing so fast uh, that they thought of the end of the century, which is what fin de siècle means, uh, was the end of a previous era, and we we're getting into a new era. So fast forward to the end of the 20th century, and Nam June Paik looks at what's happening with video, uh, and he says, this is, we're on the, on the um, cusp of a new era. Um, and he turned out to be pretty correct <laughs> um, in a bunch of different ways. So this one, uh, TV Buddha, uh, is easily understood if you know a lot about 
uh, Zen Buddhism or Buddhism in general. Um, so there's this idea in Buddhism that um, you can kind of think of it as the trip of the Buddhist. Um, and the Buddhist uh, goes through life where they start life as um, a baby, as a child, as a toddler. And when you experience things as a toddler, you experience them very directly. Uh, you do Maybe you can't talk yet or you have very few words for things. So when you see things, there's no filter. You just are experiencing things and some of them for the first time. So you fully experience them. Then when you get to be a little bit older, uh, you learn to speak, you learn to write, you learn to read, you start seeing things through other people's eyes. Uh, you start seeing things on how people commented about them before. You see them filtered through language. So you think of words instead of um, the actual um, events that are in front of you. Then the Buddhist, after a long study or meditation, depending on how you look at it, they'll eventually reach a point where you can experience things like when you were a child, uh, but I really appreciate it in, an, in a new way because you're a grown up. So you kind of like let go of those filters uh, and look at the world and see yourself as part of the world. Um, so in some ways, this Buddha is, is doing that. He's looking at himself the image of himself. Uh, and in some ways that could be a filter for him being able to get enlightenment. Uh, they say that once you kind of realize again that things are new, uh, that there's no separation between people and um, the rest of the world, uh, you'll eventually become enlightened. Uh, so it's kind of playing on that, but it's also making a little bit of a joke it's 1974, so for most people, if they were to be on television, that would be a big deal. Um, you know, people didn't have video cameras, and maybe they would have, like, film cameras, but most people would never see themselves on a screen. Uh, so in some ways, it's kind of a joke saying, Buddha, oh, even Buddha wants to see himself on TV. So the last artist I'm going to talk about is Frank Geary. Uh, and Geary is an architect, and <laughs> in some ways, he fits the postmodern description better than any of the artists that we're looking at and that he's willfully eclectic. He's trying to do things from every time. Uh, one of the first things he did uh, was his own house. So he got a job as an architect, which is, you know, pretty good money. So he could get a house uh, in this California neighborhood. And it was one of those neighborhoods where all the houses are the same. And um, they have a neighborhood group that says, you have to keep your house this way. You know, you can't have a basketball hoop in front of it. You got to mow your grass, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and he said, hmm, um, I don't think anyone will let me do the designs I really want to do. So I'm just going to make my house and do it. And I'm going to break the rules of my neighborhood, but also break all the rules of design. Uh, so you can kind of see how the house doesn't resemble any of the houses around uh, in this particular neighborhood. Um. So it just kind of has a much different look and then the houses are nice next to it. Uh, his idea that there was no unity with the house and neighborhood, he just wanted to create something that was completely different. Uh, so eventually he was able to get much wealthier people and much wealthier organizations uh, to work on his designs. Uh, and this is one of his more famous designs. Uh, the Guggenheim Museum, which is the wealthiest museum in the world by a long ways, um, of a giant endowment. Uh, they were trying to expand out of where they started in New York and Los Angeles, and they decided to expand to um, the Basque country in Spain, um, into the country, into the city of Bilbao. So this is the museum they built in Bilbao, and they hired Frank Geary to make it. Um, so what's interesting about his style is Frank Geary was really interested in the way that Gothic cathedrals looked. So you can kind of look up Gothic Cathedral online if you want to kind of see what they look like. So what's interesting about Gothic cathedrals is they often have this surface where they pick up the sunlight um, and it'll have different colors. So if you're at in the evening, like when this picture was taken, the surface of it will look very uh, kind of glowing yellow and orange. Uh, but if you saw it in the morning, it would look more blue in the middle of the day then you'd see the kind of plain white color. So he liked that. But he also liked to be able to kind of have expressive buildings. And the reason why he's able to do this is before 
um, the 1980s or so, it wasn't really possible to do something where you had shapes that were this odd. Um, but with the advent of computers, they are able to design pieces that um, really wouldn't have been possible. They might have collapsed because you wouldn't know how to be able to support it. But, you know, computer programs could crunch a million numbers and figure out how to make these unorthodox designs into real buildings. So hopefully that was a good introduction for the types of arts that we're going to look at. And in following lectures, we'll get more specifically into specific artists and specific kind of themes uh, with each lecture.